Okay, we're going to look at managing weeds, which no matter the year, the weather, or the location, I can say that the weeds, they will grow. Uh, it just seems like it's consistent uh, year to year, even in the smallest and tiniest of places where you don't even want something to grow. It seems like they grow just fine. And we have a whole plethora of tools we try to do to combat them. I'm going to go over some of them here. So first off, it's important to identify what type of weed species you're dealing with. This can really help with the control process. Whether it's in the aster family, okay, you got crabgrass, you got the daisy family here, the galansoga. Um, all of these different types have different ways we can address them to best combat them. Uh, so identification is an important first step. So how some growers choose to deal with it is just mow them. Uh, high tunnels may limit the use of large equipment. This is not ideal, but it does get the job done. You want to be careful on the mower that you choose here. They'll be throwing the um, debris out to the right-hand side that could be damaging your crops going down here. A mulching head would be better because it doesn't throw um, them in any direction. Again, not to say the best, but it does get the job done. Ideal, um, we're looking at reducing weeds. We want to keep our tunnels clean, and it takes time, and initially it takes up some money to be able to do this, laying down some. Um, fabric material here that does let water through, punching the holes at very precise um, and consistent spacings to allow our crops to be as efficient as possible. But you can see this does reduce the weeds, does reduce the time in season, can get a very clean look, can help with a lot of things overall uh, during the season. This is a great way to approach it. And again, these are high tunnels, but can also the same idea can be applied to field grown crops. Mechanical mowing. Uh, mowing an intended or planted cover crop can help hold soil together and still allow for water to infiltrate through without any residual material at the end of the season, uh, such as plastic. It's going to be a difficult to initially get the in-between row cover established here and here, uh, but once established, it does offer a lot of benefits in that regard. See, plastic is still being used for the main crop, but the area here at doing that soil uh, not dealing with that mud that could develop. Just simply mowing this and have nice clean covers. You can see it can work with plastic culture, it can work with um, row covers, and it can work on the large scale. Using that plastic mulch layer, see here, if you haven't used one, this is uh, the type of equipment it requires. Uh, typically a decent uh, size tractor, depending on the mulch layer, depending on what you're pulling, depending on your soil. Uh, typically need a minimum of 30 to 40 horsepower to be effective. Uh, and you want to use one mil embossed plastic as recommended because that reduces tearing. The last thing you want to do is get halfway down your field and have this tear and have to repair or the wind catches it. Uh, it can cause all sorts of issues. Uh, so again, specialized equipment here, but it does offer some advantages if you have the right equipment. That physical barrier, you can see here, here's our onion plants. And then here's that same material we saw in the high tunnel or it could be used in the greenhouse. Keeps the walking path clean and even eliminates the transfer of soil by workers from field to field. So that's two advantages. Soil-borne diseases are a big issue, and if you have one field that's contaminated, it's very easy for um, workers or even yourself to walk in the field and transfer it over to an another field. Here, you're creating a little bit more of a barrier, reducing the chance that occurs. These are expensive, and there's always the weed edges. You see here and here, there are some still weeds that do develop. They're not 100%, but they do reduce it significantly. In more than just in between rows, if you can cover an entire field, you got to watch the wind on setup and during, so you don't want it to cut or damage your uh, new transplants here. If you have a plant set vine, uh, this grower here, we have some, uh, it could be watermelons, or it could be some squash plants that are going to vine out, or melons in general. Uh, here, no weeds, clean, clean uh, fruit, makes it easy to harvest, you only have your own crop there, uh, a lot of advantages. Keep in mind, though, that mice do like this area to kind of live in, and uh, is wise to wrap this up at the end of the season. Place sandbags in season to help hold it down. At the end of the season, make sure you wrap it up and store it outside the field. Onions. Uh, to reduce weeds and thrips, I suggest growing onions in reflective or silver plastic mulch, as we see here. Silver is not necessarily the same as gray. You want reflective, shiny, bright. What that's doing is that confuses some of the insects which way the sun is, and it can help reduce your thrift pressure, in particular with onions. <clears throat> also helps reduce the weeds. You might think, well, with onions, I'm punching a lot of holes, right, for all my individual plants. And that's true, but there's still benefits offered. So again, I still recommend that if you're planting onions, 
uh, and doing them in rows, a, you plan on the silver or reflective mulch. It can really save a lot um, with insect pressure later in the season. With any plastic, whether it's silver or brown or black or red or any other color that they offer, field cleanup is important. That's time consuming and you have to find a way to dispose of that material. So again, with everything, with every pro there's a con. Something to consider when we're doing plastic culture. We need to find a way to dispose of this and we need to take the time to remove that from our fields. Some people use mulch between rows. Once established, it can offer many benefits of manufactured weed block. However, it's often hard to get the mulch um, to do all the rows, a lot of area. Uh, it can be time consuming to apply. Growers sometimes get round bales to kind of try to roll them out. I can be used initially, um, but good in between rows, in between plants. Again, once established, it can be great, uh, but it can be time consuming to get this all neat and orderly. There's also chemical control options, such as herbicides. Uh, many options, certain chemistries have longer lasting effects than others. Be sure to protect the main crop. So going down and spraying in between rows, here we see no problem. But notice on this setup here, we have uh, barriers. So the nozzles that spray in here killing our weeds in between rows, it's not going to drift over and kill our main crop. Herbicides are different chemistries to match the application. They can be very effective. Some have uh, residuals and that can be concerned about drift. But if used effectively, as we see here, uh, very efficient kill, um, very directed, only in the area we want it and not here. And you can see these crops are doing just fine without the competition. Quick to apply over large areas, or you can even spot spray herbicides. You don't have to do the whole field, you can do just one area here. But if you miss an area, you're going to know it, because it shows uh, how specific herbicides can be. So a lot of times herbicides, oh, they're horrible, they're going to kill the whole crop. Well, we can really see how effective they can be. And in here, in a large-scale application, that grower just missed that little thin strip there, and you can see those plants are doing just fine. Again, herbicides do allow some opportunities, some options, if they're available to you. There's also no-till operations. Not necessarily require herbicides, but often used in conjunction with those. Uh, can be known to burn down the cover crop. For pumpkins, can help keep the pumpkins clean, uh, but watch for mice. They like to hide in this residual cover. Uh, but again, less trips in the field, reduces costs, um, allows these vining crops to vine out without much competition, so that's some advantages. But again, especially late in the season, the mice can start burrowing holes in the pumpkins at an increased rate because they have all of this forage to kind of hide in. There's also zone tillage. Um, this is tilling only thin rows, uh, and then the plants will actually be started. This leaves most of the soil undisturbed. Advantage is it can break up soil compaction because it goes deeper than most tillage. Reduce fuel consumption, reduce time in the field. Here's some examples by Jude Boucher. Um, he drew up some figures on time and fuel savings. Reduce field prep time by 66 to 83 percent. And fuel savings, 72 to 77 percent fuel savings because you're only going through one area instead of plow and herring the entire field. The disadvantage to this method does take special equipment, uh, can require a bigger tractor, for example, a two row zone uh, builder here, it takes about 70 horsepower is recommended. And for a four row, it would be 120 horsepower. This might be out of the league for um, some people, other people just may need the equipment. Uh, farms can also share the equipment, so that can reduce your individual cost. Cultivation, another way to deal with weeds, can be limiting uh, with plant height. Um, measure the tractor for clearance. This is where, if you saw my previous view of the farm equipment, the John Deere M, we've got a lot of ground clearance. I can easily run over rows, uh, particularly for potatoes, without a problem. About 22 to 24 inches of ground clearance. Some tractors do not offer that, so you want to be careful and mindful of that. Sometimes you have to space the rows a little bit more so you can just drive in between them. Other times you can just drive right over them. So again, just something to consider. And that's where the planning comes in. Stale seabed is another method. The goal is not to go very deep when you're cultivating. You just want to scuff the surface as these two um, farm all tractors show. The tractors um, with good ground clearance are ideal so you can get in between the rows. These are the trike set up here and the wide front here. And we're just kind of going through and just scuffing the surface up to knock the weeds down. And our middle row here is our crop. Basket weeders are another option. Uh, this is the looks very similar like the Alice Charmer G because you're able to look down, the engine is mounted in the back. Spacing is important on these and depends on the crop. I say here you want to avoid cultivator blight. What cultivator blight is when the cultivator is running down and just slips a little bit to the left or right and cultivates the actual crop, it's causing the blight. You're actually damaging the main crop. So you want to try to avoid that. Uh, 
Make sure your cultivator has got a good coffee in the morning and is willing to go and stay focused on watching that and only taking the weeds out. There's also flame weeders. It was like having a little fun outside. Um, don't till right after you flame weed because they're just going to bring up seeds that are deep in the soil. You just want to flame weed and just kill the top. Good for killing recently germinated weeds. Can be done just after planting to ensure the crop has a head start. And there's a lot of burners here with uh, the tank. Also good in areas with impervious surface to go through and burn them down. Uh, again, has its advantages. This is a good example, and there's a lot of words here. You can always pause the video to read this, but carrots, as you know, if you've grown those, inherent with weeding. Uh, timing is very important, as I mentioned before. Here, carrots grow slow, weeds grow quick. We try to clean the bed before weeding. This is an example someone gave. They did two rows here, um, planted and then recently flame weeded, and then flame weeded very early and could be tilled in some cases. You can see the amount of weed pressure here is greater. It does get a little less deeper in the um, row, a little further away, but this is our ideal case here. The left of double rows of carrots, four rows in total, were flame weeded and planted early. The weed pressure is near greater at the near end and at the far end. On the right hand side, though, several more rows of carrots were planted flame weeded and planted two weeks later. So the weeds don't all germinate at the same time. You might want to flame weed an area, let it rest for a little bit, let the weeds regrow, flame weed it again, plant, uh, so you kind of get your crop a head start. Does this last forever? No, but it gives your crop a big head start. So this is where keeping records and timing is important because you definitely want your rows to look like this and not like this. Solarization is another um, option for you if you have a big piece of plastic. can be used for disease control, but it's better suited for weed suppression. Uh, oftentimes it's quoted as suppressing disease, and it can, but it, the hard part is getting it to go deep enough into the root zone. After you do this, please don't till, as you um, completed for maximum weed suppression. If you solarize and then till, you're bringing up those weed seeds that are down deeper up to the surface, and you're kind of negating your whole solarization process. So ideally this plastic would be removed, and your crop would be directly planted into that. Hand weeding tools are also um, great. Stirrupo, uh, one of the best weeding tools, keeps you upright, handles in between rows real easy. You just kind of constantly keep after it. Um, sharpen that blade up, a uh, little rotating head there, and makes it a lot easier. Uh, we did pretty large areas with a you know, little stirrupo, and it works great. You just got to keep after it. Hopefully that was helpful in reducing your weed time you spend weeding this growing season.